Um, my name is Melissa McHugh McGrath. I'm a certified professional dog trainer um, in Boston, Massachusetts for New England Dog Training Club. I'm gonna get into that in a second. There are two other people that you can see on video. This is Anne and Diane, and they are some of my colleagues at New England Dog Training Club. And Diane also owns her own dog training business in Danvers called Every Dog Dog Training. They are here to help you in the chat today. So if you have any questions, you can go ahead and ping them. If you have questions that you want for the entire group, you can actually just write, you know, like, you know, to answer publicly and they'll flag those and I can talk about it a little bit more at the end during the Q&A at the end of today's presentation. Um, but if you need a little bit more resources or help or guidance, Anne and Diane are here for you. Um, so I'm going to try to get started. I'm going to share my screen, hopefully correctly this time. <laughs> and present. All right. So today's presentation is called Navigating City Life with High Drive Dogs. Um, again, my name is Melissa McHugh McGrath. I'm a certified professional dog trainer out of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, um, if you guys have any questions, we are at nedtc.org and you can certainly uh, reach out to us via that link um, or you can email info at nedtc.org if you have questions about today's presentation, if you have any questions or concerns, um, or if you're interested in any of our other offerings. We have these talks coming up frequently throughout the rest of winter and into the spring. We have one coming up on how to make your own paw wax or how to use mental stimulation um, beyond the Kong is what it's called. Some of them are for a fee and some of them are free. I'm giving another free one in uh, February and that is going to be on um, if you wanna be a dog trainer, things that you might not consider um, or things that you should think about when you're thinking about becoming a dog trainer. So we have a couple of fun ones coming up. And we also have a bunch of classes online and, you know, thanks to COVID, I guess, like it, there's been a lot of horrible things with COVID, but I guess the one shining light out of it is that we have moved all of our things online for the safety of our students and our staff. Um, and as a result, we are able to reach more people like you guys who are here today that might not have ever seen a conversation like this um, through our club. So. Thank you for joining us. And if you are interested in puppy classes or sports or tricks or anything like that, Diane is in the chat. She has her own dog training facility. We have the New England Dog Training Club. We have lots of resources for you for online things. I also wrote a book called Considerations for the City Dog, which a lot of this is in. Um, I grew up in a hobby dog sledding family in very rural Maine, and I live in Boston now. So I could see the differences between rural and urban living. And it's very, very different for these dogs and the owners. Um, and we're going to talk about a lot of that today. And I'm also the host of a new podcast called Bewilder Beasts, if you guys just like silly animal stuff. So that's a little bit about me, your host, and our club. Maybe. Here we go. So we're going to talk a lot today about what exactly is drive. Is it a thing? Um, and we're going to talk about how those, how perceptions of high drive dogs and um, urban living um, can collide in really fascinating ways. We're gonna talk about what happens when drive is misplaced. I'm sure y'all have some ideas on that. Um, we're gonna talk about appropriate workarounds and we're gonna be talking a lot about management and fun, I hope. <laughs> I'm still trying to get my notes to come up on my phone. Um, I don't usually talk this slowly. I'm just trying to buy some time. <laughs> All right, guys, well, we're just going to wing it and I'm not going to have notes. So we're going to see how this goes. So drive, what exactly is drive? Um, so when we're talking about drive, I think people tend to think about high energy, maybe more frenetic, insatiable energy. I want to see, um, this is a 12-year-old border collie. This is my former dog, Sadie. Uh, she's about 12 years old in this video. And in it, you're going to see, I want you to see where her focus is. This is a border collie who lived in an urban environment. Granted, she's a lot older here. And she was also on a boatload of drugs for behavior issues. Um, but I want you guys to see what it is that she's focused on and all the activity that's going on around her. And think about the word drive.
Do you have a hat? Yeah. Do you like your hat? Hi. Where's your puppy? Can you throw this for Sadie? Uh-oh. Ace, can you throw that for Sadie? Get it, Sadie. Sadie, take. dog's attention? Was it on the kid? Was it on the traffic behind her? Or was it a focal point on that disc? Um, and I want you to contrast that. This was a high energy dog with a lot of disc drive um, in the city of Boston. Um, and I want you guys to compare that. This is my current dog captain with the president of New England Dog Training Club's dog, Gandalf. They're very different personality-wise, and you're about to see why in a second. <laughs> so I want you guys to think about this. Is this drive, is his energy focused? Is he working towards a goal? Is he doing anything with intention or is he just being a big old goofball so there's a big difference between energy and drive there might also be a component of genetics so when some people think about drive they might think of like a border collie driving sheep that drive to work a herd or bird dogs their instinct to go after things that flutter greyhounds chasing the bunny on the track or a real bunny in real life. So instinct is that part of drive and does it have to be genetic? Um, when I'm working with higher energy dogs in an urban environment, this is actually in a, a little park in Somerville, Massachusetts. Somerville is the densest populated city at, in New England. Um, but you can find tiny little pockets where you can work. Um, and this is a a Boston Terrier named Ollie, who put almost every Border Collie to shame that I ever worked with as far as disc dogs was concerned. So if you have a high energy dog, I think it's important to maybe think outside of the box and see maybe what other things might they be interested in. Because most people don't think of a Boston Terrier in disc dogs, but you're about to see one do that right now. And these discs are a little big for her. <laughs> this is a student's dog. Good catch, Ollie. Good job. So I think it would be hard to say that that dog doesn't have drive, right? But what does she have drive for? It's important to think of drive, not necessarily as just frenetic energy, but drive in the context of today's discussion is going to be energy that you can target for a specific thing. And it might not be, um, it may or may not be genetic. It may or may not be high energy because when you're watching a dog who's really working, when I watch Captain sniff and he's doing nose work, he's not, well, he usually comes in like balls to the wall and really crazy and hyper, but when he really is focused and he is settled and he is working, his movement is with intention. And I think that to conflate the idea of drive as just high energy and unfocused, um, unfocused energy with the intentionality and the training and the due diligence that trainers and their, their handlers put in to dogs to get drive. Drive can be built with reinforcement over time, um, that those two things can be different. Is it insatiable? Well, Suzanne Hatz, Dr. Suzanne Hatz says that they don't use the word drive as a predictor of behavior. 
Um, psychologists don't use it as a predictor of behavior. Animal behaviorists don't use it as a, as a behavior marker. Um, it has to be um, something that you consider in maybe an activity. So a greyhound might have really high drive in the situation of greyhound racing in the presence of a rabbit. If X, then Y. If rabbit, then run my heart out. But is he going to go after this cat who's asleep on him? <laughs> Maybe not. Um, so in this context, he does not have drive. Right now he's out cold um, and this cat is perfectly happy about his, his full body warmer. Um, these two actually got along swimmingly and, and this wasn't even my cat, <laughs> but that was my husband's greyhound. So drive is not insatiable. It has to have a, a, a place to go. So that dog that you saw just kind of running around the yard, this is him 90% of the time in the city. He is a high energy dog that you would normally see um, if I take him to the New England Dog Training Club, he's bouncing off the walls, He's crazy. He's howling at people. He's howling at dogs. The, the trainers that we have that work him, one of the things that we offer at New England is an intern program where interns can come if they want to think about being a dog trainer. They can do some grunt work for us. And if they want to go ahead and try to learn to be a dog trainer, then they go ahead and they take a couple of dogs through our program. And we do that to make sure that they know how to handle a variety of dogs, not just their dog, or maybe not just a dog. Because if you're a dog trainer, you need to know how to handle lots of dogs. So we'll put them with Captain, who you need to be really, really fast to keep him motivated because he is a fast worker when he's not out to the world. Um, and then we'll give them Gandalf, that big Pyrenees that you saw in that first video with, the, the, with Captain zipping around he's harder to motivate. So we need to know that our trainers can put pressure on, pressure off, work fast, work slow, figure out when to put on the gas, when to take off the brake, put on the brake. So it's really important to know how to work drive and how to use motivation. Um, but 95% of the day, he's like this out there with my daughter right now while she's doing online learning. And he's a pretty active dog. So I think it's important to think about drive as something that you can focus. And here's um, my friend, Liz. She's my colleague, uh, former boss and friend. Um, and because I don't have my notes, I actually don't know the name of this dog. And I'm so, so sorry, Liz, you did tell me and now I can't remember. Um, but we tend to think of border collies, right? Going back to the genetics. We tend to think of them on sheep. And this one didn't have sheep. I think the story was that he was a neglected dog. He, she was fostering him to try to find him a good home. And so she was trying to make a video with this dog to show like some really fun things that he could do. So she put two discs in a mailbox. And you can see here, I'm going to use my little pointer. You can see here that border collie eye, right? So he doesn't necessarily need to have sheep. If you're in an urban environment, you might need to get creative with your the focus of that dog's drive or the focus of their uh, their energy, the way that you get their energy out. And she used discs, which is kind of a natural way to go with a lot of dogs. But if you don't have a yard, you might not actually be able to do disc dog disc dogs. So you might have to get even more creative. Um, and then here's another dog, not a border collie. This is my friend, Chris, and his beloved dog, Harper. He's a husky mix and he does disc dogs. So again, thinking outside of the box for these. So when you're dealing with things like drive, um, I always say, use what your mama gave you, right? So like, if you have a half hound, this is Captain, um, he loves dead trees if there are critters in them. <laughs> and so for him, dogs can smell 40 feet under your feet. That's four basketball nets, right? So I could try to put him on disc. He doesn't like it. He might chase it once or twice, but that's not his thing. So I think if you're dealing with a higher energy dog, and that's the term that I'm going to attempt to use throughout the rest of this presentation, I want you guys to think more in terms of higher energy instead of drive as this global idea. Like when you see a dog who's working, if Sadie were driving sheep or discs, she would never drive sheep. She was afraid of them. She was, I joked that she was a broken border collie, but she loved discs. She could care less about predators or like little prey animals in trees. But Captain, that nose, 
he will follow it into the woods and never come back, <laughs> right? Um, so it's important to see what it is that your dog is inclined to do and how you can use that thing that they're offering you as their owner, as their trainer, as their handler, um, to figure out exactly how you can use that to your benefit. Um, so here are two dogs. Um, and if you came here by way of Trisha McConnell's uh, blog, thank you for coming. You might recognize the dog on the left as Maggie. That's Trisha's Maggie. And the dog on the right is a friend of mine. Her name is Ashley. She's a competitive disc dog handler. And this is Shine. Um, look at the intention with these two dogs. They are both working really hard um, and their energy is focused. There is no doubt that these dogs in this context have drive. But if you were just to see these two images and not know where they came from, would you think, would you know which one was on disc and which one was on sheep? Probably not. So if you can take that drive, that instinctive drive that a dog like Maggie has, that Border Collies generally have, and put it into something else, you can still work with the instinct and the, the thing that their mama gave them and put it into something fascinating and fun and appropriate for this city. And that's what we're gonna get to today. So again, going back to using existing behavior to your advantage, what do they already like? Do they like to sniff? Do they like to chase? Do they like food? I do. <laughs> Do they like prey? Um, is there an outlet that you can find for that activity that is appropriate and not destructive? Um, if you need to really mix up uh, and, and consider the things that your dog really likes um, with the things that you really like. We got Captain and when I threw a ball to him a couple times, I'm like, great, he likes toys. I have a new disc dog now that my previous dog had gone the way of the Rainbow Bridge. So I finally get another disc dog back. But as soon as he came back to live with us, it was very clear that he kind of did it just to be like, yeah, it's all right, but I'm not into it. But that knows, that schnoz, right? So now I'm a scent work handler. That wasn't something I intended to do, but that's what he offered me. Um, when I have students that come in with their dogs, usually doodles, jumping like Tigger the Tiger on amphetamines, saying, I want him to be a therapy dog, that's not to say that dog might not be a great therapy dog with a lot of work and a lot of intention and a lot of training and a lot of impulse control and management, but that might not be what that dog wants to do. That dog might be saying, I really want to do agility. I really want to go on nature hikes. I really want to do something more active or fly ball. Um, so look at what the dog is offering and what kind of activities the dog is already engaged in and see if you can find an activity that you also like that combines their drive or their energy and their uh, preferences to what it is that you would like to train. Um, and maybe you just need to get a second dog that can be a therapy dog. Um, management, 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 and training are going to really help you get there, but you've got to meet your dog halfway. So now that we've talked about energy and drive, right, we now need to look at the city, which is another layer to this whole thing. I, again, I live just outside of Boston, so this is basically my clientele. You're dealing with noises like garbage trucks, teenagers on skateboards, sirens, upstairs neighbors who may or may not be wearing high heels, um, so then you might be hearing click, 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 click all day long. I may or may not have had that experience. It may or may not have driven me nuts. Um, smells. We tend to think of dogs, as we, socialization and experiences for dogs as things that they see, right? They see a garbage truck. They see a teenager on a skateboard. But again, there are the noises, but there's also the smells garbage trucks, again, teenagers on skateboards, have you seen X body spray? <laughs> like exhaust from all those cars, chicken bones in the, in the, um, in the medians or like in bushes. Cause like raccoons will go through trash cans and drag chicken bones all over the city. I cannot tell you how many chicken bones my poor dog has ingested in the last five years that he's been with us. Um, and space is often restricted and often shared. So you can't just let your dog off a leash to go zipping around and play. That's not kosher in the city. You also have to think about how living works in a more urban environment. 
some apartments are different than others. When people who don't live in the city tend to think of apartments, what I find is I generally assume in a, a, a more apartment style building where you have rows and rows and rows of homes like I have here. Um, but some like the one that I live in, it's an old house that was chopped up into two apartments. So we only have, we have three neighbors who live upstairs. We have three people in our home and we live downstairs. Um, so they might be chopped up. Churches might be chopped up. Old schools might be chopped up. Um, these multifamily units generally don't have elevators in older cities like Boston. Um, and they might have, uh, they might not even have a shared entrance of, or they might have one door and then branching from that are two separate doors to their individual units. Some are those more traditional apartment style buildings. You have long hallways, which if you have a Greyhound, that is awesome. <laughs> Elevators, doors every 10 feet, right? So if you were to look at this from a dog's perspective, right? From our perspective, it's easy. We go from point A to point B. It's a straight line. I need to get to that stairway at the end of the hall. No problem, right? But if you're a dog, this is what you might see, right? You might have dogs barking at you at every door coming underneath the doorways here, barking at you. You can smell everybody's lunch, dinner, breakfast, poopy diapers, Axe body spray, everything in these apartments, plus all the noise and the TVs and the microwave ovens and conversations, everything in every unit as you're going by. Plus dogs, straight lines for dogs are the third circle of hell, which makes hallways and sidewalks really hard. And where that comes into play with high energy dogs, when I'm dealing with clients who call, they'll often say, I have a high energy dog or a high drive dog, but then I get there and the dog might not actually be an active dog. The dog might be exhibiting signs of stress because of their living environment and because they're not necessarily getting what they need on a behavior side. Um, so. If you're curious, and this is just broad strokes, this is not diagnosing anybody's dog. This is not, um, this is certainly not complete, but just think if the dog is high energy, exercise and mental stimulation in the right balance for that dog should satisfy the dog. Training can improve over time. So like if I'm trying to teach a dog to look at me um, in the presence of somebody walking in through the home, um, sit, stay, and look at me when somebody walks into my house, which is not happening because of COVID, but bear with me. So if the dog is sitting and looking at me, awesome. Um, but if the dog is more anxious, the dog might not have the emotional bandwidth to be able to sit and look at me. It might be more of a management thing where I've got the dog still on a leash for a lot longer than maybe if I'm still doing that for years instead of just weeks or even months, depending on the energy level of the dog and the dog's experience with training, if it's more than a couple months and I still can't get that dog to sit when somebody comes in through the door, there may be something else going on. Does the dog have an off switch and can settle down? If an activity like with Sadie with disc dogs, if it was missed because of heavy rain or she was hurt and she's starting to act more bouncy or like maybe starting to destroy things or is like maybe a little bit more frenetic, but then she gets that exercise once the rain is stopped or her injury heals and she goes back to being kind of more chill. Awesome. That's probably a more high energy dog and exercise and mental stimulation are probably the quote prescription for that. But if your dog goes to doggy daycare and is running around and is playing all day long and the daycare is like your dog is great and then that dog comes home and is still really like energetic and searching and looking around and panting pacing a lot is not settling after they come home after exercise if you feel like the behavior is managed and you're not making strides in training um and and it getting worse or you might suspect there's an anxiety part to this a component to this if your dog is experiencing a shorter fuse or like kind of more startle response, escalation to growling and biting, this might have very little to do with high energy. Um, I would say if this is a dog that you're thinking of, 
then my suggestion would be to go to a veterinarian first and then see if there's anything going on, especially if any of these things are sudden onset, and then consult with some professionals that I'm going to explain here in a couple of slides. But very rarely are things so cut and dry. You might have a little column A and a little column B, right? And that's not to say that exercise and mental stimulation won't help with anxiety cases. But I do think that it's important to at least get a better idea as to what's going on instead of just saying, oh, that dog just needs more exercise because as you'll see, that could backfire. So this is um, Trisha's other dog, Skip. Um, again, on sheep. So you can see that intensity, right? So when I was a new trainer, I really thought a lot of the cases I was seeing really should just be, oh yeah, your dog just needs more exercise. Well, we got to really think about what exercise is, right? So I could take a dog like Skip or, or Diane in the chat. Um, she has a Malinois, right? I could put her dog Bonita on a treadmill and just let them run. And they could run and they could run. They're not looking at anything. They're not sniffing anything, but they're just running. All I'm doing with just exercise is building their endurance. And that is not what you want to do with a dog that's in the city that is already maybe a high energy dog and a breed that is bred to work. Building their endurance is not what you want to do. <laughs> what you want to do is find a way to satisfy that dog. So you need to find a way to try to integrate thinking skills with, um, with their exercise, right? So that way you're getting a nice balance and that's what's going to satisfy the dog. People generally sign up for things like agility or disc dogs um, for the go, go, go. I have a high energy dog or I have a high drive dog or I have an active dog. They come into the class and then they're like, this dog needs to run. He needs to run, he needs to run but it's not the running that's going to get the dog tired. It's the impulse control and the anticipation of the go. The anticipation of the go is what's going to get that dog tired and the problem solving while they're on the go, the communication with you. In this case, um, this dog is listening to a sheep herder and watching sheep, right? So the decision-making in that is really hard. This dog has a lot of input coming at him all the time and making that pivot watch the sheep, listen to Trisha, come off the sheep, do this thing. Oh wait, Trisha's saying doing something, but I can't because this other variable that she doesn't see and I have to override what she's telling me. All of that decision-making is going to make this dog satisfied and tired. Um, the same with your dogs at home. So you have to figure out what the balance is between exercise and mental stimulation. It's not just run, 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 run. Balance is key. So what I did here was I took, <laughs> I, I did this um, just, this is certainly not um, a real thing. This is just more of like a, an image to, to prove my point or to make my point. If I have two hours with Captain, I could split it evenly between training and management, which is really mental exercise, right? I could do some mentally stimulative games, like maybe find it or some nose work, right? And then I could do some aerobic exercise. And if I took that two hours that I spend with him every day on our walks, on our uh, training sessions, like when he goes to classes with me, when we do go to classes, things like that, this is kind of what his day would look like. And he's a pretty satisfied dog, but it's not this simple. Your dog might look more like this right? Your dog might need, this was what I kind of figured when I was thinking in the way back machine for when I had a border collie in the city, you would think that she would need a lot more exercise, but really we did a lot more mentally stimulative games like rally obedience. We did um, some like at home agility. We did a lot of find it. We did a lot of training um, and her exercise was actually quite short but this is also a 12 year old dog who was on a lot of behavior modification medication and she was um, in the city. So like I didn't have a place to take a, a dog aggressive dog to a place where she could run. So we had to supplement it. And so we did a ton of mental stimulation with her. And this was the plan that we kind of came up with that worked really well for her for the last year and a half of her life. 
Um, when she was a puppy, she would need a lot more exercise. So that exercise would probably be up a little higher. Mental stimulation might be down a little lower, but it was still in the context of disc dogs, which is a dynamic fetch. It wasn't me just standing in a field throwing a ball because that's just going to, again, build her endurance. But it was, Sadie, come sit, jump over my leg, do a spin, now go get the disc, bring it back, catch this disc and do a backflip and weave through my legs. Now go get this disc over here. So again, just like Skip in that earlier photo, she had to watch me and listen to what I was communicating to her, respond on a dime and think and make choices and the impulse control. I would ask her to stay and I'd walk halfway across the field and then release her. It was that communication. It's the impulse control and the anticipation that made her more tired. If I was just standing in a park throwing a chuck it, I could stand out there and did for two to three hours and she would barely break a sweat. Whereas with a half an hour of just that dynamic fetch, she was done for the day. And I think that that is an important lesson. If you have a higher energy dog in an urban environment or even in a not urban environment, it is important to think about, it's so easy to just open up the door and play fetch with your dog if you're in the country, but those dogs need mental stimulation as well. If they're walking around in a backyard, they're sniffing for squirrels and goose poop or rabbits or birds, or they're sniffing and they're getting mental stimulation just by being outside anyway. But if you're in an urban setting, you might not have that option. You might not even have a yard. Um, so it's going to take a lot more mental effort for you to figure out exactly how to meet that. So to kind of catch up here, stress and environment, right? Frantic hypervigilance is not the same as high drive. Does your dog have an off switch? Yay. Um, if not, and the dog seems more anxious and certain environmental triggers kind of keep a dog up, like maybe noise, like in our case, like if, if a truck backfired, our border collie would be in the bathtub for four hours. Fireworks were the worst. If no amount of exercise is going to make her feel better, in those cases, if, if the root of their energy is anxiety, exercise is not the solution, it's stress reduction. And that's going to be something that you're going to maybe need a little help with if you're realizing that this might be your dog. So in that case, I would reach out to IABC.org for maybe a behavior consultant, the Pet Professional Network, um, sorry, Pet Professional Guild is what I meant to write there. Um, for a behavior consultant, animal behavior network for a certified, a certified applied animal behaviorist, uh, cpdt.org for a behavior consultant or a positive reinforcement trainer, check your sources, um, references on, on those trainers, and dacvb.org for veterinary behaviorists. And if you have questions about which kind of professional you should be looking for, you can hit um, Diane and Anne up in the chat and they can maybe help guide you through that or you can send them a note or send me a note or send a note to nedtc.org and we will make sure that we get you to the right kind of professional who can help you. There are others, but make sure that the person you choose has an appropriate credential for the services they advertise. So if they're saying they're an applied animal behaviorist, they have a PhD. If they are saying they're veterinary behaviorists, they have a board certification from, you know, from this organization. So make sure that you're checking credentials. But if that's not the case and your dog is just excited, you might have, um, you might see that drive can go wrong. Um, I've seen herding dogs, uh, this one in particular, have to go to the hospital for foot stitches on multiple occasions because she didn't know how to turn herself off. If you're in a city, you might have to use different environments to run your dog. So I would take her to a tennis court. And I, would, I learned after the first time she had to get stitches that she won't stop in the presence of a ball or a disc. So if she's run, 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 she's shredding her feet on the, on the pavement, on, on the surface of the tennis court. So we stopped doing that. But if I had um, friends who would watch her and they would do the same thing, she has had to go multiple times for foot problems because she would bleed before she would stop. Um, she also tried to herd the Atlantic Ocean, which 
weirdly didn't work for her. Um, other herding dogs, you might see dogs that nip at children to herd them because they don't have an appropriate outlet. Scent dogs, um, we have several in the city that come up um, from places where there are more hounds that need homes and then they find themselves in the city. And while many hounds make great apartment dogs, some are a little more vocal. And some neighbors don't like beagle baying when the beagles are watching the pigeons across the street all day long. <laughs> so that dog might need a different outlet. Sight hounds, um, there are cases of them chasing fluttering paper because it just kind of triggers their, ooh, I gotta chase it response. But greyhound groups, let's say, um, let's say somebody's greyhound gets loose or a foster greyhound gets loose, greyhound groups know to look for train tracks because those are long straightaways um, that greyhounds see and they're like, I can go. So they will go to train tracks first to see if they can either find a running dog or to see if maybe they find, sadly, a, a dog who might have been hit by a train. Um, but these instincts can backfire and it's really important to see if you can find an appropriate outlet for their energy. So here's one way, this is one way that we keep Captain um, comfortable. We live in a 700 square foot apartment. There are three humans, two dogs, we have a fish tank and the, the dog. Um, and again, I said he's higher energy in the presence of certain things, but to keep ahead of it, I need to make sure that he's getting energy out. A safe way that we can do it if it's raining is to work on our training skills, but I let him chase his food. So if you have a hallway in your apartment, this is one thing that when we trainers say, have your dog work for their food, this is an easy way that you can do it. So I'm just gonna show a little bit of it. So sometimes I'm asking for come, sometimes I'm asking for tricks, sometimes I'm asking him to do other things. Um, and I am terrified of basements. So this is actually really hard for me, um, but, <laughs> but I wanted to make sure that he could run. Um, so just trying to get him to work a distance sit and come. So he is working for a third of a cup of food. That is his breakfast allotment. And then I'm going to send him out. And then I'm not going to show you guys the entire video, but this is something that you guys can do with the skills that your dogs have. What I didn't realize was that because of the rain, it was soaking wet over there because our basement is also leaky. So like my foot got really wet and it was really gross, but the things we do for our dogs. Um, but it's really important to like, think about the skills that your dog already has. You don't need to have fancy equipment necessarily for a higher energy dog. You can use their breakfast, have them chase it around the house. You can incorporate like touch, sit down, spin, teach them a new trick, and then they've eaten their breakfast and then you can go on a Zoom call. Um, so that's one very easy, um, not very expensive solution. Why won't you go? There we go. You can use tools and your spaces creatively. So here we are working by a highway. In this case, Captain, because he's Captain, I cannot let him off leash. Even if I could, given that there's a highway right behind me in this video, you can see that he is still on a long line. He is tethered to me at all times, but he's out 30 feet. I have my six foot waist leash tethered to the long line. He's running out and back. I am because of, um, COVID, I'm at a courthouse that's across the street. This is the environment that we live in. It took me six minutes to walk here. So I can use an empty parking lot. I can work him with distractions nearby. And this is exhausting for this dog. And this might work for you as well. So I'm going to show you guys here how you can use the right tool um, to get your dog a little bit more exercise here. So again, I was talking about a tennis court earlier. If you don't have a tennis court, you can just use a vacant parking lot. And because he already knows find it, this is his thing, I can throw the food pretty far. And it's the finding, it's the anticipation and the reward of getting to find something that is going to get this dog tired. It might not get your dog tired. So you have to figure out what it is that your dog is willing to wait for to go get with, with gusto. And that's the, that's the drive that you're going to want to build. So you can see how he's watching me. He's like, what are you going to do? And I can throw it in the grass. I can throw it on the concrete. But this is a third of a cup of food. And then he went home and slept the rest of the day. So that was really, really great.
for him for that day. But you can see how bouncy he is. He's just like, yay. I mean, he has, he's five, been working with him a long time. He started to get a little distracted there, but I could work on recall, but he's like, okay, okay, okay. I get to go, I get to go, I get to go. Um, so he's very excited about this. And I think this is something that many of you guys can do too. If you're used to using a long line in an urban environment, find a new place to go. Even just changing the scenery is going to help them think and they're gonna be more excited. Like I said, we tend to think visually, they're thinking through their nose. So taking him to Lowe's or taking him to um, a different park where there are different smells and different kids that play and different dogs that leave their notes and their graffiti all over the place, that is gonna make him way more tired than me just keep taking him on the same walk and doing the same thing every day. So just mixing it up can help you. So again, it's not just the go, 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 go. It's the stop, wait, listen, now go. So what we noticed, and if I have any of my disc dog students here, they can, they can confirm in the chat. Um, disc dogs for my students is way harder to do indoors because we're working more on impulse control and accuracy. And if you're doing disc dogs outside, you can just throw the disc and the dog can run further and they can, you know, and it's impressive when they make those long catches. But when they come inside and you only have like 25 feet by 30 feet to work with and you have to think about how you're controlling your throw, when you're controlling the chaos, your chaos and your dog's chaos, they're controlling their chaos, it's a lot harder for the dog and the handler, and they are more satisfied after, in, in essence, they're really on the floor with their dogs for no more than like 12 minutes at a time. Um, not at a time, but throughout the entire hour. So like you might have a dog that comes on for like three minutes to work on a skill and then they go, and then another dog comes on the floor, they work for three minutes on a skill, they go. So throughout a course, a dog in a one hour class might only be on the floor for 10 minutes but they are exhausted when they're done. And that's because they're thinking and they're working and the owner and the handler are working together. And with these higher energy, and in this case, high drive dogs that want nothing more than that piece of plastic are exhausted. If you are working with, uh, if the dog is working with you and you are working with a goal in mind, even if it's I'll work for five minutes with his breakfast, that is going to be way better for the entire health of, of the dog than just running outright for an hour by bike. And that is really important to think about in this city because every time I, I do hear these cases, my dog needs more exercise, my dog needs more exercise, my dog needs more exercise, and they might not be wrong, but I want you guys to think about how to change that exercise so it's more dynamic and not just all out run. Making good decisions is exhausting. <laughs> Can confirm. All right, so mental stimulation ideas, right? Um, you can prepare your food in advance. You can use Kongs. That's the one that most people tend to think of. But my little hack for that, so Kongs have like that little hole in the bottom so that way your dog's tongue doesn't get vacuum sucked inside, which would be a bad day. So they have a little hole in, on the other side. Um, and if you fill it with yogurt or canned pumpkin, it drips. So if you save your egg curtains, you can fill up your Kongs and then tip them upside down. So you can see here in the door of my freezer, that's an egg carton. And then the Kongs are standing up in the egg carton. So that might be a quick way to keep your freezer clean, keep the Kongs from getting thoroughly frozen. Cause if you put them in plastic bags, they still kind of a little soggy. Um, so this worked really well for us. If you have, if you even have a little patch or a little patio, um, even a little balcony, you can put like one of those plastic kiddie pools, like the hard plastic ones, not the, not the blow up ones, because that'll backfire. But if you have like the hard plastic kiddie pools, your dogs can jump in and you can put either water or you can even take pieces of like recycled paper, things that are going out in the recycling anyway, bags, uh, paper bags, not plastic, um, cardboard. You can fill that pool with stuff and then scatter their food in that pool and then they can dig around in it. So again, you don't need to get a lot of equipment. You don't need to have purchased a lot of stuff. You can hide treats around the apartment, ask your dog to stay on their bed and then hide treats or their breakfast and say, find it. You can scatter food, their breakfast on the kitchen floor or in the bathtub and then cover it with a towel or an old sheet. Especially if you have like a dachshund or a Westie or a dog who really likes to dig, this way they can 
shake what their mama gave them, the thing that they have, if they are interested in digging and you're constantly saying, don't dig, don't dig, don't dig, find a safe way for them to dig and to work for their food and they're gonna be more satisfied. Um, snuffle mats, if you guys haven't seen snuffle mats, um, actually, Diane, if you could pop a link in there for some snuffle mats, that would be super helpful. Um, they're basically like fabric um, uh, fleece that's kind of looks almost like an upside down hedgehog or like fake grass. And you can take food and scatter it in there and the dog can like hunt for their breakfast. It's super easy for you to set up. Captain did it this morning. Um, if you have cats, you can do catnip in it too. And they like that as well. Um, if you have a yard, um, for anybody, if you are in an urban, suburban, or rural environment, instead of just letting your dog outside without anybody watching them, take their breakfast, scatter it in the backyard, and let them hunt for their breakfast. They look for 20 to 25 minutes, then you go in the house. This is also a great alternative if it's hot outside, if you guys have like 90 degree days um, in the summer, and you need something safe for your dog to do. If you're thinking about exercising a dog in the city in the summer, it's uncomfortable for everybody and dangerous for the dogs at times. So using like a little patch of grass, scatter some food, let them have some of that sun, get outside, get some fresh air, snuffle in the grass so they don't overheat and then take them right back in into the air conditioning. That's a great way to keep a, a more energetic dog calmer. You can combine mental exercise, <laughs> mental stimulation and exercise in the same activity, like I did with Captain with the food. He's running and he's thinking and he's eating. So I'm doing all three in that exercise. But if you're doing dynamic fetch or disc, or you can do this with tennis balls or bumpers or sticks, a thing you throw, um, that is having them do things to get the thing. Agility DIY. You can unscrew the broom handle off of a broom and if you have two um, metal folding chairs, don't put it across the seat. That's way too high. And, and given that most people live in apartments with slippery floors or wood and no traction, don't do that. We want your dog's ACLs where they are. But what we do, what we could do is lower that down to like that little crossbar behind the legs of the chair and then put like maybe bath mats on either side of it so the dog can kind of hop over a little bit. So you can do a little over. Um, you want to do it safely. You don't want to get a lot of a, a run or a heads up, but just kind of like a nice controlled whoop, whoop in a small space. The control is what's going to get your dog cal uh, calmer. You can teach a new trick. I've been working on back up with Captain. His hind end awareness is terrible. And it's hilarious to watch him like Bambi try to back up <laughs> like Bambi on ice. Um, so that's been enjoyment for me during COVID, um, but you can work on sit pretty. That's a physical exercise that is really hard for dogs um, because they have to build up muscles to go against gravity. So that might be a good one if your dog is healthy for it. Um, if they have bad hips, maybe not. So find something else to do. You can work on cue discrimination. There's, um, I've been working with Captain on step up versus hop up. Step up is two feet up on a box, hop up is his whole body and he's getting it. So you can work on one for a week, the other for a week, and then start to mix it up a little bit and see if, see how long it takes for them to put it together. Oh, these are two different things. Awesome. Flirt poll, happy Googling. Make sure you type dog when you're looking, when you are looking for flirt poll, because you might get some very interesting search results otherwise. But a flirt poll dog, um, it's basically a glorified cat toy that you kind of shake. It's got the stick and like the little toy at the end. That's what they call the flirt. The dog or cat goes after it. Squishy Face Studios in the image here has, I think, my favorite one, or you can DIY one. Uh, Diane um, has made her own. So if you want to know how to make one, she can probably help you out with that. Um, but I usually just buy them because I can't make things. Um, <laughs> um, but the, um, this has a bungee cord. You can ask, sit down, stay, run away with the flirt pole and then release your dog, get it. And then let them come after you. This is an outside toy, not an inside toy. Um, unless you're at like a dog training facility. Um, like I would take captain up to Diane's place and play with him with the flirt pole there because there was space to do this. So if you're fortunate and have that space, but if you're, um, 
if you have a little bit of a yard, you don't need to have a mile of yard. I was able to play with my border collie with this flirt pole, get her some exercise, her impulse control, all of it. While I was nursing my baby while she was in like a front pocket um, baby carrier, nobody knew she was in there eating <laughs> like because it had a big cover on it. So my baby would be eating and I could just stand there and wag this stick around. My dog was tired, my baby was fed. It was amazing. I felt like a superhero. Um, so th this is a, another good tool for you if you have a higher drive dog, especially one that loves chase and tug. Other sports and activities that you can consider. Um, we have Rally Obedience. That's one that we offer at New England Dog Training Club. Um, and I know Diane also offers it at Every Dog. Um, and so we can get you to the right resources if it's something that you're interested in. But really, Rally Obedience is moving obedience. And my Border Collie, when she was 10, 11, 12, we started doing some rally classes just for fun um, because she couldn't jump as much. She couldn't go as much. She had arthritis. She had a lot of things that were going on that it wasn't healthy for her to be chasing discs or doing uh, hurdles anymore. But what we could do is I could set her up to uh, do rally obedience. So that was fun. Um, and it was exhausting for her mentally. And she was learning skills that she already knew, but putting them in a new context. There's another variation of rally obedience that you can do. And that is literally write down all of the skills that your dog already knows. Is it sit, leave it, down, touch, spin, uh, sit pretty, roll over. And you can put those signs or have a partner put those signs around the house and you can walk up to every sign and perform the trick. Out of context is going to make your dog think and that's going to make your dog tired, um, good tired. You could do, if you have high energy dogs and you have the ability, you can go out of the city and try herding trials. You could try bite work if you have a dog that is driven for tug. You could do agility. Um, most cities and, and rural places even have agility options. Sled dogs. Now this image, this image always cracks me up. This is a student of mine. And this is about a block from Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> Um, you can see this is here on Ave at Larch Street Place. Um, these are two dogs that she has in the city and she used to just travel out to like Vermont or New Hampshire. If you're not from Boston, that's actually not that far for us. It's about a half hour drive. The states on the East Coast are very wee <laughs> compared to the states out West. So it's only about a half an hour in either direction for us in Boston to get out of the state. That said, uh, these two dogs, would go out to the more rural states and go to go play dog sledding for days on end. And this handler, Sue, um, we had a horrible series of snowstorms in about 2014, where we ended up under like a hundred of inches of snow in four weeks. Every Saturday we were dumped with feet and feet and feet of snow. And they finally shut down the city and nobody could leave. We didn't know that was actually gonna be a preview for 2020, <laughs> but we she decided, okay, well, nobody's allowed on the roads. Um, there's fresh snow, I'm gonna just suit up the dogs and go for a run. So she's zipping through Cambridge, Massachusetts on empty streets in a blizzard with her two Huskies. <laughs> and so she sent me this picture and this ended up going viral on Car Talk. Um, scent work and nose work, these are things that you can do in your home. I personally have like a six week scent work class on my YouTube channel that you guys can just try and see if you like it. And if your dog likes it, find a class to get real in-person instruction. Um, Diane offers it. I know um, we're offering it through New England in January. There are options for you. And because of virtual, there's a lot of places that you can get help here. Earth dog, if you have a tiny little guy, a tiny terrier, this one is actually size and possibly breed specific because if the dog doesn't fit in a nine inch hole, it's not gonna work. Um, it's a series of underground tunnels that you put um, a ratting dog or a terrier type dog, so like a Westie or a Doxy, into these tunnels. And then they have to go find either a fake rat with odor or a real rat that is super protected. Um, they find it and they get to like use their instincts in a good way. I personally, I feel bad for the rat, so I prefer the stuffed rat with the odor, but whatever. You could also just put in any scent. If you've done scent work, you'll know how to do scent discrimination. So you can put your own odor in the tunnels if you have your own tunneling system. Barn hunt is fun. Search and rescue, that is a volunteer thing that you can do 
um, with a young enough dog and good training. And if you're outdoorsy and have a billion REI gift certificates, this might be a really great place for you to look to. Um, I will take questions here, but I really just wanted to say thank you guys so much for coming. I know uh, this, uh, we had some tech issues, but I appreciate you guys all coming. Um, and if you have any questions, I will take them. And um, I know we had Diane and um, Anne in the chat. I'm gonna stop my share here. All right. So Melissa, we did, I just, I don't know if you can see the chat, but Rhonda and I kind of chatted back and forth about, um, uh, is it okay if I read your com your chat, um, Rhonda, to the, I don't know if you're on mute, but. Um, yeah, I, I muted oh, everyone. Oh, okay. So um, Rhonda had a question about the hallways and, uh, oh. You know, it can be difficult for a dog. If it's difficult for a particular dog, is it appropriate to carry a dog to the elevator or stairs to avoid the challenge of passing many doors? I'll tell you what I did, but I'm, I'm you know, just, but, you know, I like Melissa to kind of check, but I, I thought it was fine with a lot of reinforcement if your dog's not confident. However, the, the goal is to eventually get them confident and happy about being able to walk. And um, it sounds like that's what Rhonda's doing. Yeah. Uh, just make sure it's when you do have to pick your puppy up, it's just, you know, lots of food, good high value food. So they're not scared. Um, Correct. So anyway, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Melissa. Um, I, I would also put, um, put it on cue because yeah. especially a lot of little dogs, what happens is when they get picked up, have you ever been on an elevator? Well, obviously this person has, that's what they're trying to get to. But if you've been on an elevator and, and it drops out from under you or you go up too fast, um, your belly goes, Whoop! and what happens with a little dog, part of why they get that like little dog syndrome tag is because people just constantly go and just pick them up without their uh, acknowledgement, without asking permission, without warning. Those dogs are just like suddenly lifted up into the sky um, because we want to pick them up. So I would almost put it on cue to help the dog, especially if it's already kind of anxious going down a hallway. I don't want the, whoop, the pickup to also be an indicator that it's going to go down that scary hallway. So maybe work in the home a little bit, like come up and just kind of like look for acknowledgement from the dog. Is it cool if I pick you up and then go that way? Um, another thing that you could maybe even try if, if they know, if they know for sure, oh, <laughs> Diane got kicked out. <laughs> if they know for sure that, um, that the, that it might be a visual thing with the doors and the sounds and everything, one thing you could try is, um, oh, what is it called? I think it's now called Thunder Cap, but it's like a little mask you can put on your dog. If you remember scrunchies from like the 90s, it's got like kind of like a little scrunchy thing that goes around the muzzle. It does not hold the dog's muzzle down at all. It's just a way to fix it. So it kind of scrunchies over the muzzle and then it kind of flips up almost like a blinder for horses. Um, and if you could do some find it work in the hallway, take away the visual stimulus so they're not looking at the straightways and they can sniff their way down the hallway, almost like Hansel and Gretel down to the elevator. That might be a really good workaround as well. If you can take away the visual while you build up confidence, it doesn't work for every dog, but it might work for this one. So you can give it a shot. I think it's called a thunder cap. It, it used to be called something else, but I think the thunder shirt people bought it. Um, and you can get different colors and they're not totally blinding. If you hold it up to your face, it's almost like a, a very thick um, mesh. So you can see through it. So I've had dogs do like touch, but it just kind of visually blocks enough that they have to use their nose. And if they can use their nose to get down the hallway, they might feel more confident than staring and not breathing and getting more paranoid as they walk down that hallway. Yes, just like for horses. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that might help. Any other questions? Yeah, elevators are terrifying. <laughs> oh, hi to Chicago, howdy. <laughs> All right, so I think we're gonna Go, oh, for feeding a dog without a bull, any other products you would recommend? Um, Wobbler's good, Orby's good. Um, 
Diane and Anne, if you guys have any to suggest as well, certainly jump in with them. I like, um, I think Kongs are easy. Um, I like anything that's easy, honestly, but any of the balls that kind of roll and just deposit food as they go, super easy. As long as, <laughs> although if you're in an apartment and you have like beds that rise up so you can put storage, the ball will also probably end up under there at some point. At some point. So maybe put up some blocks so like your dog can't put it under the furniture all the time. Um, there are, um, I'm trying to think of like the favorite ones that we use. Captain's usually just like working for it or he'll, um, or we'll do the snuffle mat. Those are the ones that we like. What about you and Anne, Diane? Uh, yeah, the only other um, thing I'm thinking in the warmer weather, some people throw the, if it's kibble, throw the food in the yard and just kind of have them do the search for their dinner in the yard, the whole, you know, in a special, you know, not too dispersed, but um, yeah, and the snuffle mat and the Kong, I use the wobble Kong, but you already know about that. I like that one as well. Captain figured out how to open it. He, uh, I, I would feed him in the wobbler and what, <laughs> what ultimately happened was I, I put the wobbler um, and I put it in his bed and then we would start to eat dinner. Um, and what, <laughs> so then he'd be out begging for food. Like six seconds later, we couldn't figure out why. And I go in and it would be open. Like, how did he do this? Like it's, it's a giant Kong and he doesn't have thumbs. So I eventually put up after about a week of this, I put up my camera and I recorded him. <laughs> he had figured out if he put his jaw over the narrow end and squeezed, he could de-thread it and just lift it and just eat it as if it were an addition, he'd be done in 30 seconds, which was not the point of that tool. <laughs> so, but some dogs will use their mind even if you don't want them to. Um, using water, chicken broth, um, it's somebody saw a slow feeder bowl in the freezer. That's an awesome, that was Diane. Um, so you can actually fill that with like either some, uh, low sodium chicken broth water with their kibble and then put that in the freezer. That's a really good option. Um, again, maybe not give that to a dog on a rug, but if they're in their crate or on like, um, in the bathroom or on linoleum, something easy to clean up. That's a perfect idea. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, the other thing about some of these puzzle toys, some of them, like the Nina Ottenson ones or the more puzzly ones where they have to like move a lock and like solve a quest before they can actually get into it. Um, some of those end up um, being kind of frustrating for some dogs. So again, going back to like the mental stimulation, what is the thing that your dog is already doing that they like? Um, my border collie would pick up those and throw them against the wall, which worked. It was also a very expensive toy purchasing uh, period in our lives because she kept breaking them. So when we realized she just liked to throw the things, that's when we started getting the balls, the rubber toys, the things that she could kind of throw around the house. And she loved those. Um, Captain, he likes to squeeze and really gnaw on things. So he has things that are a little bit more in that vein. Um, so if you're, uh, I would, if you're just trying puzzle toys and, and my dogs, like since I've lived in a city have never eaten a regular meal out of a standard dish ever. They're always working for their food, either in these toys or in like when I'm taking them out for a walk or when they're hunting in the backyard or like Today's Zoom call, Captain, I set him up with his snuffle mat in the other room with my daughter while she's doing a, her Zoom lessons. He was eating, I came in here and set up, got a cup of coffee and he was perfectly content instead of following me around the house. Where's my breakfast, where's my breakfast? Um, so if you can find the way that your dog likes to take in food um, and so maybe get one cheaper toy of a couple of different um, methodologies of getting the, the food out, and see, is my dog getting too frustrated and this isn't fun? Is, the, is my dog enjoying this? Does my dog like to throw it? Does my dog like to nudge it? Does my dog like to pull or chew? And then you'll be able to find the right kind of toys, the right umbrella of toys that might be a more appropriate one for your particular dog. All right, so I think we're gonna call it. If anybody else has any last minute questions, go ahead and add them in the chat. Um, but again, um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much to Diane at Every Dog Training Center. Go ahead, check out her stuff. Anne is my colleague and friend from New England Dog Training Club. 
they joined last second once we found out we had a hundred people coming today um, for today's conversation to help me with the chat, to help me with the text. So thank you guys so much. And for everybody coming from around the country, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath. You can find all my stuff at New England Dog Training Club or melissamchumcgraph.com. And we will be putting this presentation up. Hopefully the recording worked. We will be putting it up on YouTube later today. We don't know what our YouTube limits are. We don't, we haven't had to use it very much. So it might be in a couple of pieces. <laughs> like We will figure out that when we get there. Um, feel free to reach out to any one of us at any time. We're happy to help. Thank you so much for coming and we'll see you next time. Bye guys.